trust me because I'm an expert. Been getting good market advice lately? Bear Stearns is fine. Help with those nagging symptoms? The one way to cure eczema, gout, arthritis. And consultants at work. Not losing faith in the professional experts, are we? Take heart. Qualified help is coming right up. And I'm, I'm not going to be bullied by your ranting. Only the experts who are guaranteed to be wrong get on television. I'm Anne Marie McDonald, and this is The Trouble with Experts. Obviously, I Experts. We can't live without them. They tell us how to fix our cars, decorate our homes, raise our kids, and cook our meals. They tell us what wines to drink, what art to buy, and what opinions to hold, as well as how to eat right, exercise right, and live forever. If you want to go on a diet, there's someone who's going to tell you exactly how you should diet. And if you want to clip your toenails, there's someone who's going to be an expert in that. Every day, armies of new experts, analysts, pundits, consultants, and other authorities are churned out to fill our needs in the media and elsewhere. I'm an expert in prison survival. Trust me, I'm an expert. Prediction! Problems down to the stock, Amanda. It's going to go to zero. And we often cede our own opinions to them because, well, they're experts, so they know better, don't they? In the 2008 stock meltdown, we discovered that our most important experts, our financial gurus, didn't know much at all. And no expert predicted the recent Middle East revolution, though everyone had plenty to say afterwards. They realize Mubarak is fine. We're going to have an evil empire. So what about all the other experts out there? Should we listen to them? Does having expertise mean you make better decisions and better predictions than regular people? Or are they just part of a new cult, an ever-growing expert industry that's become our new religion? The average expert is about as accurate as a chimpanzee throwing a dart. It's like a like, sort of vast army of fools, and they're afforded absolute authority in mainstream media. The huge, huge percentage of experts are absolutely full of nothing but BS. And that's your soundbite for the day. It's time to examine the experts and see how reliable they are. And we'll start with the experts who intimidate almost everyone. Wine experts, whose godlike ratings tell us mere mortals what we're supposed to drink to join the fine wine crowd. These experts are among the snootiest of authorities who take one sip of wine and pronounce it to be pecan flavored with a hint of melted licorice and stone dust. But do wine experts really know what they're talking about? A good place to find out is here in France's Loire Valley. Frédéric Brochet started tasting wine on his father's vineyard when he was just 11. Today, he produces a million bottles a year of Chateau Domaine en Pélidé. But Brochet is also a professor of onology the science of wine at Bordeaux University. He says most wine experts can't tell a great wine from an ordinary one, and he's proved it in many experiments. In one study, Brochet asked a group of wine experts to taste two bottles of Bordeaux, one labeled as a fancy Grand Cru, the other as ordinary table wine. In fact, the same wine was in both bottles, but 54 of the 56 experts preferred the wine in the better bottle, fooled by what they expected to taste. Lorsque les experts attendent un vin de qualité, alors ils recherchent les qualités. Dans le cas où les sujets attendent un vin de mauvaise qualité, alors ils recherchent les défauts. In his spare time, Brochet is also an expert who consults for Fauchon, Paris's most prestigious wine store. He holds informal blind tastings here too, 
for passing shoppers and some professionals. And he's been known to switch a bottle or two. Brochet is swapping this $30 Chateau Chamiret for this $500 Nuit Saint-Georges, and vice versa. Will anyone know the difference? Unlike his real experiments, people here can discuss the wines and help each other in their detective work. But even so, most are fooled. This wine consultant rated the $30 wine higher than the $500 one. This non-expert chooses the better wine in the cheaper bottle. But the store's young wine consultant corrects her. Only he's been fooled. In one famous study, Brochet found that experts can't even tell white wine from red wine. He served 54 other wine experts a red and white wine to compare. In fact, they were both secretly the same wine. Only one was dyed red with a drop of food coloring. Not a single expert spotted the trick. Brochet says it's all about grape expectations. Les seules fois où les sujets perçoivent euh, que c'est le même vin, ils sont complètement naïfs. Parce que justement, s'ils sont naïfs, ils ont moins d'attente de, de, des odeurs du vin rouge. C'est des oui. gens qui n'ont jamais bu de vin, en fait. Brochet says no wine costs more than $20 a bottle to produce. And the price of very great wine is largely driven by mythology and marketing. Ce sont les dégustateurs qui eux-mêmes euh, créent les différences entre les vins. Donc nous devons faire confiance à nous-mêmes, c'est-à-dire à notre langue. But wine tasters aren't the only ones dictating our tastes. And in some fields, the stakes are breathtaking. In the multi-million dollar world of art, it's hard to know which paintings have great value and are worth buying, and which are just imitations. But a good art expert can help you decide, or so you'd think. Only here, too, top experts can be fooled by what they expect to see. This exhibit at London's National Gallery is embarrassing. So disgraceful, these paintings are usually hidden away in the basement. But now, they're out for all to see. It's a collection of fakes and forgeries that fooled the museum's experts and curators for decades. The museum is bravely displaying its mistakes for all to see. But it's just a small part of the picture when it comes to art experts being fooled by forgers all over the world. How does it happen? Meet British artist John Myatt, who forged more than 200 works by the great masters from Monet to Matisse, then passed them off as originals with the help of a con man partner. Nicholas de Stael, if anybody's heard of him. For almost a decade, Myatt fooled England's top art critics, galleries, museums, and auction houses in what Scotland Yard called the biggest art fraud of the 20th century. Myatt started forging in the late 1980s by visiting museums to study the style of well-known British painter Ben Nicholson. And I looked at the painting, stood there for about an hour or so until I sort of more or less knew it backwards, went home and painted something along the same lines, and it seemed to work quite nicely. Myatt says his paintings were amateurish at first, yet he and his partner, John Drew, took two fake paintings by well-known French artist Roger Bissière to the world-famous Tate Gallery. They pretended to be art historians and fooled the museum's experts into thinking the paintings were genuine. And um, then two people in white coats bring the paintings up. So we're all looking down the table looking at the paintings. And they said, oh, they're just so lovely. Oh, isn't it, you know. And they were painted in just ordinary house paint on modern canvases. Their expert looked at it and he said, yeah, looks good to me. I thought it was unbelievable. I just thought it was just too stupid to be true. 
By the mid-90s, Myatt had painted almost 200 fake Chagalls, Picassos, Moreaus, and Giacometti's, and seen them sell at Europe's top auction houses. Gradually, his forgeries got better, but he still can't believe that so many experts were fooled. They've been told what they're going to see, and so when they see it, they see it. I feel very sorry for experts, frankly. Even the very best expert is fallible. They will make mistakes. The best fakers have never been caught. The very best fakes are the ones that you think are genuine right now in the art galleries through the world. So you don't know whether they're fakes or not. Over at the National Gallery, curator Marjorie Wieseman says even top experts make mistakes because, like wine tasters, part of them wants and expects to believe they've found something special. All art historians, all curators are looking for the next great discovery so that they want to find an important lost masterpiece. And sometimes they lose sight of doing the right homework. I think what gets in the way most often is greed, and not just financial greed, but also scholarly greed. You want to be credited with a great discovery. In 2009, a major Hamburg museum opened an exhibition of Chinese terracotta warriors, only to have them exposed as worthless fakes. Meanwhile, an art expert who ran a German state museum was duped into declaring that a painting with bold splotches of color was the signature of Ernst Wilhelm Ney, a Guggenheim Prize-winning artist. In fact, the artist was a chimpanzee. I think it, it's museums, auctioneers, private collectors, art historians, scholars. I think everyone is um, vulnerable to that. Art and wine may be elusive qualities to judge, but business is made up of cold, hard facts. That's why there are countless business coaches and management consultants whose advice fills bookstores. But what exactly makes them such experts? When former management consultant Matthew Stewart started out, he didn't have a shred of knowledge about business, just a philosophy degree. But his employer gave him a three-week management course that turned him into an overnight expert. I was an accidental consultant. I pretty much fell backward into consulting. The first surprise for me was that my absolute lack of training didn't matter. I, I didn't know how the stock market worked. Stewart soon became a jet-set consulting star, traveling all over the world, advising businesses and governments. He explains how anyone can do it if they look the part in his book, The Management Myth, why the experts keep getting it wrong. So there, there are a number of simple tips if you want to be an expert. First thing is it's important to be tall. That's always a good way to establish authority. Second thing is to wear bling bling, shiny things, wear things that show that you have wealth on your person, drive the right cars, stay in the right hotels. Well, nothing sells like success. That's very important to establish your expertise. You demonstrate your knowledge and your expertise with the result. The fact that you've turned these forces in your favor. Maximize. Minimize. To pass as a successful expert, says Stewart, you have to sound like one, too. You do need to master a certain amount of jargon, which meant I dropped a lot of bottom lines and I tried maximizing things instead of making them better. You don't want to say our strategy is based on doing what we do well. It's, you say it's based on our core competences. So that's how you become an expert. In Paris, historian Etienne Auger believes experts are our new priests and jargon is their secret language. So jargon is going to be the magical terms, you know, like in most religions. Latin, for instance, for the Catholic Church can be like jargon in the sense of you don't understand it, but the priest does. It means that he's closer to certain powers that you don't deserve to be close to. Matthew Stewart feels that management gurus are an illusion. 
that the whole field is a dressed up facade that pretends business is a science run on formulas. There's a notion out there very important for our economy that there are these people who have special access to a kind of expertise. It's an expertise in how to organize businesses, how to run the world. And that creates this opening for people to step forward and say, I am the expert. I know how to run human organizations in the same way that you, sir, know how to build a cell phone or design a building. And yet it's, it's unfounded. But Stewart says if he was a management expert fraud, so are all the rest. You're in a field where the truth is there are no genuine experts. The field is cracked. The basic idea that there is a kind of science, a technology that you, are, you can apply in this field, that's just false. Yet corporations and governments love to hire experts anyway to cover their ass sets. Basically, it's a cover your butt kind of deal. Uh, if things uh, later on go down the tubes, you want to be able to say you listen to some pretty smart, respectable people, and they were wrong too. If it goes right, of course, uh, then uh, you're a genius, and you don't really actually have to mention all those experts who steered you in the right direction. There's another area where almost everyone is hungry for expert advice. Vitamin D, it is a miracle drug. Pomegranate juice, a study says... A new study says coffee is good for your heart. In our health-obsessed society, we look for wonder foods to help us live forever. From miracle omega-3 eggs and salmon to life-saving cereals, packaged more like medicine than food. Pineapple contains a protein-digesting enzyme called... We seek our magic answers from an army of new nutrition experts, diet specialists, and others who give us precise advice on what foods to eat and avoid to stay well or ward off cancer. Leafy green vegetables, mm -hmm. all good stuff Avocado. for the sex life. Dr. Ben Goldacre is a well-known British science critic. He says many nutrition experts have even less training and qualifications than management gurus. They've called themselves nutritionists. What's interesting is there's this group of academics who work on researching the relationship between food and health who also used to call themselves nutritionists who are now starting to realize they're going to have to change the name for what they do because it's been so devalued and caricatured by the arrival of this new bizarre profession. Goldacre says professional associations often have such informal standards that anyone can get some kind of official looking certificate. In fact, he mailed away for one from this nutrition association for his deceased cat, Henrietta, and got it. Which shows you don't have to be a nutritionist, but you also don't have to be a human being, nor do you even have to be alive to be a member of the American Association of Nutritional Consultants. Ready? Three, two, one. Ah, what do you know? Instead of an explosion, we have a lamp. Dr. Joe Schwartz is McGill University's official science watchdog. The, the false expert is a huge problem in the science world. Yeah. Many of these experts, professed experts, really are quacks. The results we obtain with thousands of patients with all types of cancer definitely proves ESIAC to be a cure for cancer. Did you hear that? The C word, cure for cancer. Studies done in laboratories... They are promoting uh, cancer treatments that do not work. They're promoting dietary supplements that, that do not work. It's this food-grade hydrogen peroxide is the one way to cure cancer, to eczema, to gout, to arthritis. To and of course, all you have to do is follow the money to see why they are uh, doing this. Schwartz says another problem is that even respectable experts get hired to do studies with industries that may compromise their research. Once you're getting paid, it's, it's very hard to be uh, totally objective. There is always an angle. You know that the people who are paying you want played up, even though it's never really stated. So any time that you know, there's, there's money involved, uh, I think the expertise becomes somewhat questionable. Ben Goldacre says that endless experts promising easy magic bullets in the media and on the Internet just distract us from the long-term behavior we need to stay healthy. I could write, uh, you know, Dr. Goldacre's healthy lifestyle book, my, like a, you know, a day-by-day -day advice diary, and it would say exactly the same thing on all of the 365 pages. You should eat more fresh fruit and veg every day for 70 years. And I'm really sorry about that.
You know, I'm really sorry it's 70 years. I'm really sorry that your five-day detox diet won't work, but that's the reality. And I think if you tell people that their five-day detox diet will work, they think, well, I can have some chips and sit around watching telly all evening instead of going to the gym. Coming up. Yes, there are even experts on experts. When it comes to expert predictions, you don't lose guru status simply because your forecast flops. Just how widespread is expert mis-expertise? Christopher Cerf is a founder of the National Lampoon. Victor Navasky is former editor of The Nation. All right. so where are we going to the two men direct the Institute of Expertology, a wandering academy that goes wherever experts on experts are needed. Voila, the Institute of Expertology. Got it. Together, they researched a book tracking the great expert predictions of all time. For instance, the stock market has reached a permanently high plateau. Irving Fisher, world-famous economist, just before the 1929 stock crash. Who the hell wants to hear actors talk? Warner Brothers, 1927. In 1962, a DECA recording executive turned down a music group and said, We don't like their sound. Groups with guitars are on their way up. After looking at the Beatles, well, you would think by pure chance that uh, the experts, even if they had no expertise, would be right at least 50% of the time. But we have not found a single expert who was right about anything. OK, maybe he's exaggerating slightly. But in their book of predictions, they show military mavens are no better than other experts. Wellington is a bad general. We will settle this by lunch. Napoleon, before losing at Waterloo. They couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. Last words. General John Sedgwick, U.S. Civil War. Christopher Cerf says that media experts, often known as pundits, have been mushrooming largely because the media needs them for endless 24-7 cable channels. More and more they use the format of having an expert who is on one side and one who's presumed to be on the other who will have a violent argument right on screen about something. Yes. I, oh, yes. No, oh, I said it wasn't yes. good investment. Please. Are there more than two sides to every issue? Suppose one person says two plus two is seven and the other person says two plus two is five. Is the truth someplace in between? <laughs> is it six? Science writer David Friedman spent two years writing a book about expert predictions and their accuracy in many fields. His conclusion? They're wrong an astonishing amount of the time. Experts are usually wrong. It's that simple. Like, surprisingly, you can actually put a number on how wrong experts are. And it turns out to be, on average, roughly two-thirds of studies uh, in, in the top medical journals end up being wrong. And he is talking about respected academic experts. But today, we're told to get an expert for almost everything. We need an installation expert to set up our TV system, and a color specialist to paint our walls. Right now, grays are popular. And a relationship expert to sort out our marriage. You should not be deceitful. And when you're married, you're married. And not to mention the experts we trust with our money and our government finances in a supposed science that's actually bogus to look at the results. Economists have studied the wrongness rate in economics journals and have concluded it's very close to 100%. Virtually all of the studies published in economics journals are wrong. When the economic bubble burst in 2008, Canadian William White was the chief economist for BIS, the central bank for government banks everywhere. Now in Paris, White says even the world's top financial experts couldn't see past their own pet theories. 
I think the experts over the, the course of the last few years have done a terrible job. They thought economics was a science. The fact of the matter is that economics is not a science. Economics is highly dependent upon human behavior. It would be a lot better if experts were to start off by recognizing how little we know about the functioning of the economy. But being wrong doesn't affect your expert status, says this author. When it comes to expert predictions, the rule is heads I win, tails you forget we had a bet. You don't lose guru status simply because your forecast flops. Gardner points out The Economist magazine once ran an experiment comparing 10-year forecasts about the economy and inflation predicted by a varied group of experts. And among these individuals were corporate CEOs, uh, economists, some very esteemed people, and also some London garbage men. Uh, and 10 years passed, and at the top of the table were the London garbage men. Meanwhile, the reign of error continues, from trivial decisions to the biggest purchase of our lives. Nice. Awesome. Give me, give me a, a top uh, so I've got... Meet Mike Holmes, top, the Canadian TV star who's on a global crusade to expose experts who do shoddy work in home renovation. His latest TV series has a new target, home inspectors. And then there's a homes inspection. Yep, they make lots of mistakes too. Really expensive ones. Done. Line here, done. Today, Holmes' crew is filming this Toronto house. It was purchased for $280,000 after a home inspector expert gave it the A-OK. -okay. When problems started, the owner turned to Holmes, who discovered it needed almost $200,000 more in repairs. Holmes has seen lots worse. All the plumbing is done. We're just waiting on the but he says the real problem is that home inspectors are seen as highly qualified experts, when many have little or no real expertise. To become a home inspector, it's, you can snap your finger. There's a one-hour course that you can do online. There's a two-week course. And really, let's think about this. What's their background? Where did they come from? Were they builders? The ones that were builders, I want to see as home inspectors. But if you just worked at McDonald's and you were tired of working at McDonald's and, again, didn't know what to do, and you just did a two-week course and all of a sudden you're a home inspector, and now you, the homeowner, looks at them as an expert? <laughs> Despite all the evidence, the expert industry keeps growing, turning out more Insta-experts all the time. Coming up, a visit to expert school. Well, it is a fantasy to be a pundit. It is a fantasy to be a guru. So there are a lot of people trying to get in. I would like to become a well-known expert. I'd like to be on CNN one day. The expert industry keeps growing, partly because manufacturing experts has become a whole new business. There are people who claim they can turn anyone into an expert in just a few days. Yes, even you. Welcome to Expert School. Best. When that light went on and the camera went on. TJ Walker teaches people to look and sound like a TV expert in days. Because imagine if I came out here today I'm going to really coach you how to be great on your image and really impress people that you're the world's greatest expert. What are you noticing? Well, at least it's not your fly. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to being an expert in the media, if there's one thing that's off, that's the only thing anyone will remember. Personally, I'd like to take out of this class. You know, it's been around for about 25 years. But His students pay anywhere from $2,000 to $7,000. Oh, the they range from successful doctors and business people to PR reps who want to become known in their fields as TV pundits. Like Sarah Harding, a former Miss Fitness trying to get known as a TV exercise expert. Absolutely, I would love to be an expert. I want people to see me as an expert in my field of specialty. I would like to definitely become more of a well-known expert um, in, in the short sales arena. I, I, I'd like to be on CNN one day. I'd like to become a sports psychology expert that goes on to news shows and sports shows to discuss sports psychology and how it impacts athletes. TJ says there's an enormous hunger for experts because of the massive growth of cable TV. 
There's a huge need for pundits these days for one reason. It's cheap. The cheapest thing to do is to have an opinionated host and bring in a couple of opinionated people, one on one side of a debate, one on another, and it's virtually free. And what is a fantasy to be a pundit? It is a fantasy to be a guru to many people. It's a very attractive career option. It can be intoxicating. So there are a lot of people trying to get in. We are looking at... TJ says you can become an expert by writing a book or having a degree in something. But the easiest way is just to get some media training and then some exposure. Because once you're on TV once, you're seen as an expert and print and radio will want you too. All right, what's the easiest way to get quoted? I guarantee you'll get quoted this way. The easiest way to ever get quoted is this. That's right. Attack. World, blame I'm everybody else excuses, in the world and then I'm call well, me I'm not going to be bullied by your ranting. TJ's golden rule is never sound uncertain. The more absolutely sure of yourself you sound, the more likely you are to make a career as a TV expert. So always say always, and always say never, but never say maybe. Anytime you can state something with finality, absolutely, always, must, he has to do this. Anytime you can do that, they're gonna quote you again and again and again. So another classroom of premature pundits marches out to sell certainty. Part of the growing army of experts who are just experts at giving opinions. A Berkeley professor is the world's leading expert on experts. He's been scrutinizing experts closely for 20 years. Professor Philip Tetlock followed 300 top government and media experts over two decades as they made 82,000 predictions. These included political predictions about world events. Questions like, Will the Soviet Union collapse? Will Germany be reunited? Will Quebec separate? The results? The experts barely did better at their forecast than monkeys throwing darts. That's like random guessing. And the more well-known and certain the experts were, the more often they got it wrong. The very worst experts, the experts whose predictions were furthest from reality, had very strong opinions. Uh, the formula for getting it really wrong is to have very strong opinions, to be unwilling to revise them in response to new evidence, and to be willing to make predictions that go out far in time. We're going to see depression level unemployment rates, 22, 25%. $200 a barrel oil. Bear Stearns is fine. Do not take your money out. This is real. If there's one take And when you have the combination of all those things, uh, you go off a cliff. We get the experts who give us the wrongest answers and give it to us in the most certain terms. They're the ones who get quoted in the mass media. We hear the most from them. They're the wrongest. So if you're actually thoughtful and admit that there are many sides to an issue, you don't get hired and you don't get heard, and you're not an expert. So more and more, because of that process over many years, only the experts who are guaranteed to be wrong get on television. If we were a lot smarter about it, if we wanted better answers, we'd look for the very unconfident expert, or the expert who was stammering and wondering and constantly contradicting him or herself. I think boring experts probably, as a rule, are more right. In almost every field we examined, we heard similar praise for the unsung, uncertain expert. When you have an expert that is absolutely certain for me, that's when alarm bells go off, and I, I automatically say, mm, no, there's something wrong here. I want to find out more. I think real experts should appear more uncertain, uh, particularly in the area of economics. Of course, it's hard to work your way up the career ladder like that. But Matthew Stewart says certainty is exactly what business consultants are selling. Well, maybe that's why I don't particularly like the expert business. I mean, I'm always questioning myself when I'm riven with self-doubt. The laws of physics are predictable, but human behavior is too complex for anyone to accurately predict. Yet in uncertain times, we crave certainty in our lives. 
Is there any area where you can be a successful expert and admit to being uncertain? We searched the skies for it. For the greater metropolitan area, today's forecast, 30% chance of showers with a 50% chance of thunderstorms. Here at Environment Canada, weather forecasts are always given with percentage probabilities behind every prediction. In fact, for longer-term forecasts, there's a warning on their site that says their predictions are no better than chance. Senior climatologist David Phillips. I mean, it's like saying flip a coin, throw a dart, turn the roulette wheel. We have to say something. We can't just sort of put a blank map and say the weather this month has been cancelled. So the best way we can communicate is to give them something, but then to also suggest, hey, user beware, don't, don't trust it. Almost anything is possible. So why don't all our experts give us similar percentages for their predictions? And why do the most confident and cocky experts usually get heard most? When we return, the secret behind the expert industry's success. A relationship that doesn't have a divorce in it. And you'll be more happy than what you are right at the present time. I don't know where else to turn. Uh, I'm in my mid-50s. I'm white, uh, relatively well-to-do. I, mean, I don't know who the hell I'm going to get stuck in prison with. You know, I mean, are these people rapists? Are they murderers? And the effect on my family has just been horrible. Well, you know what? I'm an expert at this. You've been to my website. You know that I yeah, did 10 yeah. years. I did all the custody levels. I'm going to be blunt with you, Mark. You're screwed, but we're going to do some damage control. Meet Larry Levine the latest addition to the expert industry. Larry is an ex-convict, but now he advises terrified white-collar criminals about what to expect in jail. He's a prison expert who gives a crash course called Fed Time 101. Don't go to the showers in the middle of the night, as an example. Don't go places alone. Not necessarily the other inmates you have to worry about. You got to worry about the staff. When I tell you about what's going to happen on the inside of a prison, on the other side of the fence, you need to trust me because I'm an expert. Who can say whether Larry's assured expertise really works? But many clients are desperate to believe him because they're scared and there's nowhere else to turn. And that may be why we all turn to experts. We live in a hectic world with endless, bewildering choices. And we are too overwhelmed to work things out for ourselves. So we seek advice on how to live our own lives and find it in many new preachers, from personal trainers you know, cardio workout, the therapy that to sex experts and parenting experts. To go and use the potty. It will just create more anxiety. Remember this all. Our growing dependence on experts just creates more of them. I think we're too easy on ourselves if we caricaturize this process as being about exploiters and victims. I think it's much more interesting than that. I think it's that we want to have these experts and there are people who want to be experts and, and we're kind of, we're all playing this game together. We want someone to come in and say, don't worry anymore, do this and it will get better. And if somebody's gonna say, feel better now, then feeling better now is almost as good as fixing the problem. It's like, uh... The little child that always wants to believe that somebody's in charge. And I think one of the most important moments in my life, actually, was uh, when I began my professional career at the Bank of Canada. And what became perfectly clear was that there wasn't actually anybody in charge. But I think we, we all want to believe that somebody knows and somebody really understands. Because the alternative uh, to confront all of this, what is essentially chaos, is very difficult for people to live with, I think. We look for certainty, and the experts give us that. They tell us that it's all okay, that someone knows how it all works. And they have a lot more in common with witch doctors or shamans than they would like to admit, and that we tend to admit to ourselves. And the relationship will be a relationship that doesn't have a divorce in it. And you'll be more happy than what you are right at the present time. For millennia, we have used clairvoyance, palm readers, and other fortune tellers to guide our actions and tell us what's going to happen in the future. 
But in today's modern world, we're too sophisticated to believe in fortune tellers, so we look for replacements. It's been said that those who make a living from their crystal ball are condemned to eat shattered glass. But that doesn't seem to be true for those behind the glass of our TVs who continue to talk, because we are desperate for someone to point the way. Any way at all. There's a tribe when they're out on the hunt, they don't know which way to go. Their shamans take out a bone from a carcass, they examine the cracks, they throw it on the ground, and then if the cracks point in a certain way, they go off in that direction. Turns out that that is an effective way for them to avoid preconceived notions. If they sit down and discuss where should we go, they tend to go in the same direction all the time. Whereas if they rely on the cracks in the bone and they imagine that it involves some expertise, that sends them off in directions that they might not have gone, and that ultimately proves more fruitful. In the end, we have to make decisions. We have to do things. So sure, experts, of course, play a role in our society. Uh, if nothing else, they sometimes give us the confidence to act. Typically, doing something is better than doing nothing. Back in England, forger John Myatt was finally caught by police and sentenced to a year in jail. But when he got out, a surprise was waiting. The Scotland Yard police inspector who'd arrested Myatt hired him to do a family portrait. And so did the prosecutor and some court officials who appreciated his unusual talents. Today, Myatt makes a good living, selling his forgeries honestly for legitimate fakes limited. He's painting this fake Monet for Ronnie Wood of the Rolling Stones, whose face will appear on one of the figures. But Myatt is still fooling the experts. Police think 120 of his 200 fakes are still in circulation with private owners, art dealers, and perhaps museums who value them. And Myatt would just as soon leave it that way. If they do own it and enjoy owning it, and everybody thinks it's authentic, um, you know, including the experts, then why on earth would anybody want to come along and say, oh, you know, I painted that? So perhaps there is some benefit in getting the wrong advice from experts, if the result leaves you happy. Then again, there's definitely an expert out there somewhere with a totally different view. As Yogi Berra once said, it's very hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Experts and the rest of us can catch up on our entire season at cbc.ca slash doczone. I'm Anne-Marie McDonald. Thanks for watching.